darkness, but it tells the truth as a result of a double lie. <coughs> and they tell many double lies <laughs> all the time, so actually can check them. Uh, capitalism, we said, will try to make it appear as if socialism is something unachievable. Oh, how could people live in peace? There's nothing man and woman cannot do once they decide to do it, and no student can take any other attitude towards life. No way. You may limit your own human potential by saying, I can't do that, but you must never say that people cannot. There's nothing that people cannot do, and if one believes in God, there's nothing they cannot do with God. Even if one doesn't believe in God, there's a whole lot they've done without what appears to be God, <laughs> especially in the field of military uh, build-up, military technology. Therefore, it is clear that there's nothing that people cannot do. And we say that people are going to go to socialism because of the just instincts. People everywhere fight for justice. Everywhere fight for justice at the drop of a hat. We said earlier this afternoon that the best, uh, the best example are the unjust forces. Adolf Hitler never came before the Germans and told them we're fighting an unjust war. Never. If he said the Germans were fighting an unjust war, no German would come. He had to lie to the Germans. We're fighting a just war. This war is a just war. Look what they did to us in World War I. Do this very thing. They treat us like a colony, just like we're Africans or something, or some of these barbaric people, and we have given civilization to Europe, etc., etc. He had to come to justify it and make the Germans believe it wasn't just trouble. The example we gave earlier this afternoon, we repeat that of the war in Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh is a great fighter for humanity. Johnson was president of the United States, waging war in Vietnam. When Ho Chi Minh came before the Vietnamese, he used to say, comrades, we're fighting for democracy. Comrades were fighting for truth. Comrades were fighting for freedom. When Johnson came before American troops, he used to say, we fight for democracy, we fight for truth, we fight for freedom. That is to say, all of them have to allude to the same just principles to have the people respond. Anytime they say the principles are unjust, the people will not respond. So we are aware of this, and we see it everywhere. History itself is nothing other than this. Again, the example we use this afternoon, we repeat here. If one would look at the early days of capitalism and its beginning in England, and that's where it began, one would see clearly, and it began there because of the slave trade, because England had the ports, and England had the navy, and it was the slaves that brought them the capital to start capitalism. But Karl Marx is absolutely correct when he said capitalism comes into the world with its jaws dripping with blood, especially that of the Africans. If we would look carefully, we would see that uh, throughout history, people rise up all the time. Peasants rise up, serves rise up, slaves rise up, workers rise up. And their rising up always seems to be spontaneous and temporary indeed. Most of the time it is because up to this point, the masses lack clear organization that can direct them towards justice. In a few places, they've arrived at it, as in Cuba with that great leader of humanity, Fidel Castro. There, of course. <laughs> In most other places, there is no organization. Does the people rise up? We see the example of England. When the serfs were driven off the land, these serfs who knew nothing about capitalism knew they were exploited. Now you must know something. The people may not know what forces exploit them, but they know they are exploited. And when it becomes too much for them, they slash out at anything in their path. These serfs, these new workers, who knew nothing about working conditions, but knew they were exploited, not the same conditions they had in the service, they rose up and smashed the machines, these big machines that capitalism was bringing out. Of course, we know that it's not the machines that must be smashed. It's capitalism that will be smashed. But for the workers, when they rise up, for the oppressed, when they rise up, for justice, they will smash anything that they find in front of them. That's why you must always careful to be with the people, not too far ahead of them, because they might think you're the problem. <laughs> Always be with the people. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. Pan Africanism is the instinctive love of the Africans for the unity of their continent. And we say, in order for them to arrive at Pan Africanism, they must destroy imperialism. Therefore, once you say you're Pan Africanist, you're anti capitalism and you're socialist. Capitalism and socialism are diagonally opposed one to the other. Now, there are only two economic systems in the world, only two, capitalism and socialism leading to communism. But the question of whether or not socialism goes to communism is more an ideological question than an economic question, which has escaped the minds of many. Communism is made up of three parts, dialectical materialism, historical materialism, and philosophical materialism. Philosophical materialism under communist parties is usually atheistic. That is to say, in order to be a communist, you must be an atheist. Well, you know, this is kind of hard in the Arab world. 
where the religion of Islam was not only a civilizing force for them, but also a religious force. So to ask them to give up Islam for communism was kind of difficult. And certainly to ask Africans to give up their religion just to fight makes no sense to them because they use their religion to fight. Therefore, because of this problem, a lot of people stop at socialism. So I'm not going to communism. And of course, those of us who want to carry on the debate, we are knowledgeable in these areas and we can continue the debate. So this isn't even capitalism and socialism. Now, there can only be two economic systems, only two. Simply because every economic system must respond to one fundamental question. Who will own and control the riches of the country? Who will own and control the means of production? The question can only be answered two ways. Either a few will own or everybody will own. It's as simple as that. Under a capitalist system, a few people own everything. Under a socialist system, the people own everything. It's as simple as that. Certainly, if one would just look, take a cursory glance at the capitalist system, one must see its unjust nature. How could a few people have the right to own everything? As I remember one man telling me, I said, how come Rockefeller got all that money? I said, teach him when I was a young man. Well, Rockefeller worked hard for that, worked hard for the money. Did he work harder than my grandfather who was a slave? <clears throat> of course, if hard work is supposed to give you money, my grandfather should be the richest man in this country. He was a slave. <laughs> he didn't have no choice. He got to work. <laughs> he came in the side today, I want to rest. No. So, uh, obviously, all these lies of capitalism must be made clear. Anytime a few people own everything, the system by its very makeup is unjust. Indeed, anytime people own universities and make people pay 30000 to go to year, that itself should show you what an unjust system you have. <laughs> In Cuba, where you have a socialist system, as far as the country is, under all the problems imposed upon it by American imperialism, with the blockade, etc., with its invasions, with its going over and over, over their sky space and uh, just having no respect for the sovereignty. What do you mean the Cubans shouldn't shoot him down? Let Bill Clinton get into play. Shoot him down, too. It's Cuba's airspace. They got the right to protect it. Of course they do. Of course they do. Of course, they do in a poor country like Cuba. Education is absolutely free to any level for any citizen in Cuba. Healthcare is absolutely free in Cuba, absolutely free. You pay not a penny for it. America is a rich country, the richest country in the world. When you want to see the sickening nature of capitalism, you look at America, the richest country in the world with six million homeless. Where is democracy? Where is democracy? Is this what you call democracy? The right of six million people to be homeless in the richest country in the world? Well, this is democracy, Jack. I want socialism. <laughs> I want it quick, because in socialism, there are no homeless. In socialism, the motivating force is service to humanity. Capitalism, the motivating force is profit. This capitalism and its motivating force of profit is a corrupting force. And it's ubiquitous in its corruption. Do you know it is so ubiquitous that it even corrupts students? That students don't come to school to acquire knowledge to help humanity, they come to school to acquire knowledge to make more money. Look at that. <laughs> Any country that refuses to use its knowledge to advance the country, but uses the knowledge to advance the individual, shows that it's a dying country. Knowledge, in the first instance, doesn't belong to anyone, it belongs to the people. Knowledge belongs to the people. But America has all this thing about the individual who's so genius and brings contribution and all these nonsensical statements. I remember once some poor college student arguing with me. Well, Mr. Toure, I don't agree with you about the, 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 the people. The people are stupid. It's individuals who lead them. And he mentioned Beethoven. I said, Beethoven. Is he the one that wrote sonatas and stuff like that? Yes, yes, yes. At age five. Yes, at age five, he was composing sonatas. And yes. But did this one, Beethoven, who was composing all this on the piano, did he uh, give us a piano? It's a result of constant generations handing down of knowledge. America, because it's a capitalist system, seeks to make sure that property, that property rights are held sacred. And so most important, you know, property rights, you must own everything. You must own your wife and your education, you must own it, must belong to you. Yeah? Yeah, and when you own it, you can do whatever you want to do with it, because it's yours. You know, I got my education over there. I didn't even work for it. I paid 30000 You know, I had to go get it. Seriously, now I got it. I ain't giving it to nobody unless they give me 30000 It's logical, but immoral. You see, capitalism will teach you to think perfectly immorally, but with quite clear logic. Knowledge, we say, belongs to the people. When people suffer, they suffer because they lack knowledge. That's the only reason why. 
no other reason. If you want to make a contribution to humanity, you come to get rid of ignorance. You come to supply it with knowledge. And students have, of course, the best opportunity to do so. They're in contact with ideas on a daily basis. More than our people who are workers who have to go to work, come home in the evening, they're so beat, they give a beer, can television to the next morning, nine to five, you understand? But your students, you have libraries here. You should be concerned with the values of humanity. We are revolutionaries. We're concerned with values here. We're not concerned with reform movements and changing one white mayor and giving us an African mayor who's just as corrupt as a white mayor. Don't give me a break. Or bringing one African student into Oberlin to replace their white to give them some more space, and that African student comes to Oberlin and take their knowledge as soon as they graduate, run away from the ghetto, and try to forget their people. This is not a waste of time. Pan-Africanism is going to be realized. Now, you must know something about Africa. Africa has suffered greatly. Africa has suffered greatly. But suffering has its redemptive, its redemptive phase. It certainly does. And Africa is certainly going to be redeemed from suffering. But uh, Africa has to fight all of Europe. The statement we make is a light statement. It's taken lightly, but it's true. The wealth of Europe has come mainly from Africa. When you see Paris in this big building, that's the blood of Africans there. When you see America in its building developed, that's the blood of your slave ancestors here. There's no question here. Europe has developed itself off of the rape of Africa. And not just one European country. I mean, Africa was colonized by all of the Western countries with the exception of Ireland. That's why the Africans have so much love for the Irish, even though some of them get confused when they get tainted with racism. <laughs> oh, be stupid. You never colonized us. You're fighting the British. You should be with us. <laughs> For 800 years, no less. <laughs> racism will confuse you. Confuse you. <laughs> just like capitalism confuse your thinking, make you think you're better than somebody else just because of the color of your skin. Give me a break. Man, don't even take a bath. <laughs> the capitalist system because the capitalist system pushes form over essence. It's form that counts, not essence. We say Africa is going to be free, unified, and socialist, and no force on earth is going to stop them. One of the statements we make tangentially before we go into some other roughs, some other uh, meaty statements of Pan-Africanism and then come to take questions. I know that Africa will unite before Europe. Well, we have stated here, and it's a fact, that when one speaks of uh, continental unity in the world today, one is speaking of Europe. Europe is the one who's speaking of it. But Africa is definitely going to unite before Europe. And uh, not to belabor the point, but to give you just two aspects of it, one political and the other cultural. And then, of course, from there we can go on to other areas. But uh, since it's a tangential statement, we will stop there. We can pick it up in the question and answer period. Politically, I uh, listen to uh, news around the world, and some days I can hear European leaders of uh, any of the Scandinavian countries, where they're most prominent, sometimes you can hear from Italy, but their leaders there, their prime ministers or their presidents or what have you, their political leaders can usually come and say, we're against unity in Europe, because if we have unity in Europe, it's going to smash up and it's going to destroy our, our fishing industry, it's going to stop our... Uh, it's going to uh, make trouble for our diary products. You know, it's going to they have give a lot of what appears to be really uh, serious reasons why there should not be European unity. And you can hear this all the time on any news station, these European leaders declaring their, their political positions against European unity. In Africa, most of the leaders of our countries are in a truthful statement, the very scum of our race. I mean, they are filthy. They care nothing about the suffering masses of their people. All these pigs want to do is line their pockets with money at the expense of their people. And they do it. And they do it. Africa has more corrupt regimes than probably all of the continents put together. This is just facts. But as backward as these leaders are, and they are backward, as reactionary as they are, and they are reactionary, none of them could ever get up before the people and say, I'm against African unity, not for them. They can say, I'm for African unity, lie, and then work against it as they do. But to come before the mass of the people and make a statement that they're against African unity, they'll be finished. 
because the love of the masses for this African unity is so strong there's no way any African leader who works against African unity can come before any group of Africans and say they're against African unity. This love of African unity can also be seen in the cultural aspect. I have heard songs sung about England, about France, Germany, Italy, but I've never heard a song sung about Europe. I'm not saying that they do not exist, but I've never heard one. But the songs that I have heard about Africa, I could stop with Bob Marley, who was born outside of Africa. The songs that you can hear sung about Africa must number in the hundreds of thousands. I mean that they're sung by Africans everywhere, not just by reggae people, even Calypso. Trinidad, where I was born, and Calypso is one of the most degrading uh, songs in when you hear them talk, they talk, how oh, you jamming so? <laughs> He's also born in Trinidad, you see? But even in Trinidad, back when they are, they have to sing songs like, how you doing, Mother Africa? Looking for you, Mother. Yes, it's forced upon the people. And when they sing, they sing about Africa. They don't sing about one part of Africa, Ivory Coast or Ghana. They sing about all of Africa. The same thing is to be found about the continental map. I am sure that Africans everywhere in the world know the shape of Africa. They know it. They have it now on their hats. They have it on their coats, on their chains, and their hairs. They everywhere. But uh, this continental map of Africa has imposed itself upon the world because of the love of Africa by the African masses for the continent of Africa and not for any one part of Africa. Of course, with the diaspora, it comes to be a great point because diasporan Africans don't know exactly where they come from unless, of course, they have the time, the ability, and the capabilities, as in Alex Haley, to uh, trace their roots. So for them, all they know is they come from Africa. And indeed, when they came from Africa, Africa was not divided because many came certainly before the Berlin Conference, which happened at the end of uh, slavery uh, in America. Yeah. Well, let me see. Well, Brazil was Native America. South America was Native America, yes. Uh, so uh, at the end of slavery, it came. So with these Africans from the diaspora, for them too, they just see Africa, not a country. So because of these, I just gave you political and cultural reasons. There are many more, social, etc., etc. For many of these reasons, of course, Africa will unify before uh, Europe. And the unity, unity of Africa must mean a destruction of European imperialism. It's the only way that uh, Pan-Africanism will come about. So we've just cleared the air, we told you exactly what the forces are. We do not enjoy bloodshed just like anybody else, but uh, when bloodshed is called for to demand human dignity, then we know there's something more important than life, and that's human dignity and freedom, and we're always willing to give life to arrive at freedom and human dignity. And of course, you know, I have to remind a lot of people of that. I have, uh, it's true, sometimes I do get read, oh, I met my sister here, her name is um, and Najib Malek, and uh, my sister's a prof professional nurse, so you know I have cancer, so uh, my family wouldn't let me take my first trip out unless my sister came with me to ensure that so my sister had to travel with me to be my jailer. <laughs> but I have a lot of arguments with people since I got cancer because they keep saying, well, you know, the most important thing is your life. And I tell them, no, the most important thing is not my life. The most important thing is to struggle. And I'm willing to give my life for the struggle. So what's cancer? Give me a break. <laughs> So we have to constantly remind ourselves that life is not the most important asset. Capitalism seeks to dig that in your head. If you ain't got you, who you got? No, 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 no. This is a concept of individualism, which capitalism has taken to ludicrous heights. I mean, in its culture, you see Superman, you see Rambo, you see it's just ludicrous heights, the individual. It's just stupidity. Not only stupidity, it's just untrue. It's totally untrue. Matter of fact, if you really examine this from biological aspects, from cultural aspects, from uh, social aspects, you will see that the individual which they portray must be an animal. Because it's only animals on their own, without others, who can grow their fullest animal potential. A human being, isolated from the human race, will never grow to their fullest human potential. It is the people who always socialize the individual. It's the people who teaches the individual everything. Everything the individual learns, he learns from the people. Therefore, if the individual is conscious, everything they learn, they must give back to the people. That's clear. That's crystal clear. That's crystal clear. This aspect of the individuals we can crush very easily. You know, if you take a cat, when it's a kid, a dog when it's a puppy, you take a baby, 
a human being when it's a baby. If you put all three in the woods by themselves, the dog will grow to its fullest capacity to be a dog. The cat, the kitten will grow to its fullest capacity to be a kitten. But the baby, we question whether or not it will live. First of all, it might scratch itself to death if somebody doesn't cut its nails. Certainly, if it doesn't scratch itself to death, the human beings are so stupid that they're the only species that will walk into fire with a smile on their face. The kitten will never go into fire. The dog will never go to fire. The puppy will never go. <laughs> the ant will never go. But the human being, the baby, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Human beings are isolated from their species are more stupid than other animals isolated from their species. This is a fact. You take the same dog, the kitten, the puppy, and the baby just born. Put them to live with monkeys. The dog, though living with monkeys, will grow to be a full dog. He a bar, wag his tail, and love bones. The kitten growing up against, among monkeys will be a full cat. It will meow, it will love milk. The first time it sees a mouse, it will chase it, play with it, and eat it. But the human being, growing up with monkeys, he'll walk like a monkey, talk like a monkey, eat monkey food, and try to make a contribution to monkey culture. 